Twitter. Hello, ladies. Hello. It's so good to be back again <laughs> with you this month. Even though we're not really with you, but we are with you and that we're praying for you. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to seeing you at church. And um, we just look forward to what yeah. God's going to do through another psalm as we meditate on it this month. And we are looking forward to our end of the year activity on May 14th. And you girls actually probably know more about that than we do. Although we, I'm going to be there. Uh, Linda gets to be. <laughs> I'm going to. I get crying to, I, somewhere. I miss, Tell them where I'm you're going to miss be. you guys. I want to be there so bad. But but my middle son is graduating from seminary, so we're going to be in Louisville celebrating his yeah. graduation. So that's sorry, the, not sorry. That's probably the best excuse yeah. <laughs> that we could, <laughs> but we could possibly. I am really imagine. bummed because I've. I think it'll be really fun to interact with all of you ladies. Because I think so, too. We kind of miss seeing your faces. We do. We do miss seeing your faces. Although we are planning next year to visit your groups and hoping that that will connect us to you a little bit more uh, if you'll let us in. I think you will. Hopefully. I don't know. They might not. They might not. Because we're we'll kind of weird. Maybe if we bring treats or if we Maybe. offer free babysitting. Sure. They might. Yeah. We'll see. You can um, babysit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> don't, I don't know. That's on. That's on record now. Uh, no, I like kids, kind of. No, I really do. I like my own grandkid. <laughs> Speaking of next year, let's talk for a minute about next year because this today is going to be our last psalm uh, of the year, and I'm not sure. Maybe someday we'll come back to psalms, but next year I want to tell you what we're going to do. Lynn and I have been praying about what we think would be pleasing to the Lord and helpful to you. And we have decided next year that we're going to study Jesus. And specifically, we are going to study each month one of the I am statements of Christ. And I did a little digging. And, you know, Jesus said the phrase I am 23 times in the book of John alone. That's awesome. And we know that God said that his name was I am. Yes. But in the, uh, the New Testament itself, specifically in John, Jesus said seven I am statements that are very, very specific to who he was, is, and what he wanted us to know that would be life-giving to us. So he said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. Mm. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Mm. And so next year, we're going to take each one of those. I'll take one. And then the next month, Linda will take one. And we're going to do a deep dive into what did Jesus mean and how will that be Life-changing for us. I am so excited am about too. that. There's nothing better than gazing upon who Christ is and understanding Him. I know. And I'm, being satisfied in Him so much yes. more deeply. We've talked a lot as we've been discussing the Psalms, how important it is to trust God. And we see that message in the Psalms over and over and over again. Well, it's hard to trust someone that you don't know very well. And it's mm -hmm. hard to trust someone who you think doesn't know you very well or doesn't care about you very well. And I think when we study Jesus, when we study what he said about himself and what he says to his people, it increases our knowledge of him, which mm -hmm. is something that we all need. So I think that's just going to be really, really an exciting thing. Mm -hmm. so, I love that. It's hard to trust someone you don't know very well. Yeah. <clears throat> so this month we're going to study Psalm 10 which is another lament psalm. And this one is very specific about the cries of people who have been victimized by the wicked, by those who have oppressed and abused them. And we weren't planning on ending on Psalm 10. Originally, we were planning on ending on a different psalm next month. So we thought, well, it seems like a serious psalm. <laughs> And it is, but it's also a psalm filled with a lot of hope and truth that is going to stabilize us a great deal. You know, it's painful to suffer unjustly. That's what this psalm is all about. 
the innocent do suffer and that suffering makes us doubt God and even can lead us into despair. We are going to be comforted today to see David expressing real true concern about suffering and about the wicked. And we're going to see the solutions that God has for him. Before we talk about something, we're going to review, before we talk about suffering, we're going to re review something that we've talked about before. Remember the arrow. The arrow, this illustration is critical for us all the time. And I think it's really, really critical when we start talking about suffering. Remember that the arrowhead represents our thoughts or our minds. And the shaft, the choices that we make, and the feathers are feelings. Now, it doesn't mean that one is more important than the other. However, if we want the arrow to fly straight to the goal of pleasing God, we need the weight to be in the arrowhead. And the weight represents what's going on between our ears. What is true? What does God say? Yes, this is how I feel. Or maybe, yes, this is what I've done or what's been done to me. These things are all part of it, but this is often what needs to be strengthened. Our feelings don't usually need to be strengthened. We're pretty aware of what they are. But we've got to be led by right thinking. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to communicate to you that your feelings aren't important because they are. You were created to be an image bearer of God. And there's a lot of feeling and emotion in the Lord, in Jesus, in the way they love us, in the way they care about right and wrong and holiness and all of those things. So those, it's not that they, they don't matter, but they can't lead. So I like to think an arrow would just be a stick if we broke the feathers off. Mm -hmm. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fulfill its purpose. So all three of these things are part of us and part of who we are. But when we're talking about pain especially, we've got to focus on truth. Pain makes us feel very vulnerable and it hijacks right thinking. So what I want you to do is get your arrows out and we're going to dig in deep to Psalm 10. The point is how we think really does affect how we feel. When we are overcome with sorrow, we must and should cry out to God. And one thing we need to ask Him when we're crying out is, God, what is the truth? Help me see you and know you because, oh, Father, this hurts so much. This is helpful to do, but it doesn't come naturally to us, does it, Linda? No. That's why we have to practice it. Psalm 10 is a psalm of crying out to God. We thought it would be helpful to teach through a psalm like this so that you will know how to know God's truth and use God's word the next time you find yourself in a painful place. We see this pattern of lament or crying out to God in Psalm 13, which we've talked about, in this psalm, Psalm 10, Psalm 22, a third of the psalms. We've talked about that. And we also learned about it when we had our suffering series at church last week and when the pastors were referencing Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. Mm -hmm. I love that book. And we learned how to lament then. And we're going to see that same pattern in Psalm 10. And what we learned from Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy and from our pastors was in lament, we need to turn to God. We need to complain to God. We need to request of God and we need to trust God. Mm -hmm. And we, when we do all four of those things, we can be in pain in a way that honors the Lord. We get into trouble sometimes because we get stuck on maybe one or two, especially the complaining. <laughs> right. And then we don't progress through. And so learning the lament process, I think for our whole small group last year, we dug mm -hmm. deep into it and it was really, really helpful to all of us. And we're gonna apply that with Psalm 10 today. And how we see it in Psalm 10, we see four points. We see, God, I can't see you. We see, God, the wicked, they're winning. We see, God, please help us. And we see, God, you are king. You hear, you strengthen, and you will do justice. 
That's quite the process in a few short verses. This also reminds me of the pattern that we gave the gals at the beginning of our psalm study. God, it, God is, yet I, but God, therefore I. It's a similar pattern, isn't mm -hmm. it, Linda? Mm -hmm. So let's start by reading Psalm 10. And Linda, will you do that, please? I would love to. <clears throat> All right, Psalm 10. Why do you hide yourself? <clears throat> Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush, ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call into account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his hand. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their hearts. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. O oh Lord, we thank you for your word, and I pray that as we teach it today, that your word would bear fruit in the hearts of these moms, in their families, as they teach their kids, and um, as they love you more. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. So this psalm begins with, Lord, I can't see you. That's what the psalmist is saying. That's what David is saying. Now, what he says is, why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why, O Lord, do you hide your face from me? Which is saying, Lord, where are you? I can't see you. <laughs> that is a scary feeling to feel. Where are you? Why are you hiding yourself from me, Lord? When there is unjust suffering, it seems like God is far away. It's natural to question or to wonder, God, where are you? We can't stay there, but it's often where we find ourselves. Suffering, all suffering, is horrible. But for God's kids, I think God seeming far away is worse. Mm -hmm. Lord, I can't see you is the expression of a fearful, broken heart. We expect God to help us. He says he is our helper. Sometimes, though, during tremendous pain, it feels like he isn't helping at all. Have you ever been there crying out to God and saying, God, I can't hear you or even see you? I have. What about you, Linda? Yeah, I feel like we, we've all been in different places where even a season of waiting where God, it can feel, yeah. God maybe is, is, is leaving with us with unfulfilled desires. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking... I have so many stories and uh, about my life that a lot of them I've shared already. And I was thinking, Lord, I can't. What what would be helpful? And one thought that came to mind 
um, wasn't really someone hurting me, but it was suffering in the sense of my, our kids going to England. Mm -hmm. And when they were getting ready to leave and when they left, I was tempted to think that God did not care about how it was affecting me, that He didn't care about my pain. But praise God, I know that isn't true. I met with Helen Campbell last spring and summer to get the shepherding I needed to trust God to let my children and grandchildren go to the mission field. She was so instrumental in reminding me of the wonderful ways that God loved me, even though I was doing something that felt impossibly hard. Another time was the day that my dad died. My sister and I spent the whole night trying to get to California to say goodbye to him, and when we got to the house, he was already dead. Did God still love me? Yes. But boy, that was painful. And it was a kind of pain that could have crushed my soul. But all I could say in both situations in the middle of that pain was, God, please help me. I love you. I need you. And I can't bear this. And you know what? He did. Mm -hmm. He did. It wasn't for David. It wasn't an angry cry as much as a cry for help. David says these things, why? Why do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself? Now, David was being oppressed, truly oppressed. He had people wanting to murder him. He was betrayed. He was doing some pretty scary suffering. <laughs> I don't think anyone, well, I might have had someone who wanted to kill me, but I didn't know about it. <laughs> so this is, this is terror for sure. Some of you have been or are in situations like this, and you might be saying, why God? Why are you standing far away? Why are you hiding yourself? When we are suffering, that's what it feels like. But we must turn to God and we must cry out to Him. The hard truth is that we live in a broken, sin-cursed world. This is not heaven. Mm. Oh, how hard that is. Are you struggling with the pain of living in this world? I do, often. The war in Ukraine has been at the front of our minds for weeks now. There are broken families in our church. There are people who have been diagnosed with COVID and cancer, and some have died. Now, as young, young moms, these things cause a lot of worry, and they can cause lost sleep or anger or despair. They can threaten our beliefs about God, things that we've always trusted to be true. Many years ago, I read a book about grief by C.S. Lewis. It was called A Grief Observed. And one of the things that he did in that book is he equated trusting God while suffering is a little bit like hanging by a rope. And his quote in the book was, it's one thing to trust in the strength of a rope when you're using it to tie up a box. It's another when you're using it to hang over a precipice. Isn't that good? So good. Yeah. Suffering brings us over a precipice. Mm -hmm. And we need what is true about God to help us hold on. Mm -hmm. I promise after you do that, your trust will be stronger. You know, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he uttered the words from Psalm 10, and they're also in Psalm 22. In Matthew 27, 26, Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It kind of comforts me to know that he used these same words because I have felt forsaken sometimes, and it's not wrong to tell God that. We can't stay there. But our start is to turn to that. Mm. It's okay to cry. And this in Scripture is a real cry of suffering. But you know what? It's also a cry of faith. Mm. Crying out to the only one who can answer. We can cry out this way too, but we must guard against bitterness. We can't stay in the crying out place. How are we crying out? Are we crying out in pain or in blame? How did Jesus cry out? He who suffered more than anyone, who never sinned, he never had to repent, he never hurt another person, 
he had to be tortured on the cross and separated for a time from his father. And all of this so that his father would never be separated from his children. He cried out in pain, but he always believed God. And we must too. At any given time, we've got to remember that God is doing thousands of things that we cannot see. One of these is found actually in Romans 8, 28 through 29, which says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There is good in our pain. We might not see it this side of heaven, but God is conforming us even now into the image of his son. And you know, that is our best good. And sometimes our suffering is caused by the wicked. We've said, why God, where are you? And now we're going to say, this is actually what's wrong. This is our yet I. What is the pain? Well, in verses 2 through 11, we see the yet I, and it's followed by am suffering. <laughs> and I am suffering because of the wicked. And, you know, in Psalm 10, we have the clearest explanation of what the heart of the wicked is like. So if you think about a wicked person who's oppressed you, in Psalm 10, you get a glimpse of what's going on in their mind and heart. The wicked pride, pridefully pursue the poor. They devise schemes. They boast of their own desires. They curse and renounce God. They reject God completely. They pridefully prosper without compassion or empathy. They prosper in the folly of no accountability. God can't see. I can do what I want. They puff at their foes. They refuse to be affected by the hurt that they've inflicted on others. They believe they won't suffer. And, you know, they're likened to an animal. There's a lot of lurking and ensnaring and that kind of language. Mm -hmm. um, they spew out curses and lies about God. Mm -hmm. They oppress and they do mischief and iniquity. They ambush the innocent and murder them and they lurk to harm. There's that animal language. They lurk to harm ha helpless people. Mm -hmm. They seize the poor. They crush, they bury, and they kill people. Mm -hmm. And yet they still believe that God won't see. Wow. Mm -hmm. We are seeing this all the time in our world right now. Leaders who are engaging in wars, terrorists, violent criminals, what do we learn about those people in our world today from Psalm 10? They are proud. They are proud men and women who think they can do whatever they want to get whatever they want, and they will not suffer for it. We see their pride in the desire that they have to oppress the poor, in their thoughts that won't be held accountable to anyone, in their mockery of anything good. I bet even as I say these words, all of you are like, oh yeah, I've seen someone on the news. That was, that's the picture. That's kind of the, what I'm trying to get you to see. Um, when we are hurt by this type of person, it is very easy to think that God does not see because how could this possibly happen? Perhaps you have suffered in this way. Some of you have been victimized. Some of you have children who have been victimized. Oppression is lurking all over our world now. It does seem like the wicked prospers. Why doesn't God do something right this very second? Girls, the most stabilizing thing that we can do is to remember that God is who he says he is. And he will do what he says he will do. He has allowed these things for some reason, and it is not going to be wasted. Mm -hmm. Our pain is never wasted. I love Psalm 56, 8, which says, You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? If God does this, 
He won't forget us in our pain. What causes you to toss? What things are you crying about right now? Bet you can think of tossings. I can think of tossings. All I have to do is turn on the news mm -hmm. and then I start tossing. Mm -hmm. Psalm 10 gives us language for this pain, which is often too deep for words. You might be feeling like you don't want to let anyone into your pain because it makes you feel too vulnerable. Or perhaps you've tried but found the people in your life to be either poor listeners or a bunch of people like Job's friends. God does not want you and I to isolate ourselves when we're suffering in this way. He wants us to go to Him. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we need to go to Jesus for salvation, and we need to go to Jesus for comfort. And we can't stay in the complaining, God, this isn't fair um, state. Now, that's part of lamenting, but we have to move to, toward our Savior who says, come to me. And that often looks like our step three of, of a lament, which is a request. And I think what the psalmist is doing in Psalm 10 is he's saying, God, please do something. I, I just told you what's going on. Please do something. You know, the scripture has these descriptive words for what David is asking of God. Arise. Listen to the verbs. Arise, God. Lift up your head. Forget not the afflicted. See the wicked. Take the wicked into your hands. I will commit myself to you because you help the fatherless. God is an advocate and he defends the sufferers. And he also says in Psalm 10 that he will break the arms of evildoers. That means he's going to destroy their power. These are the truths about God. And the psalmist is asking God to do that very thing. And he's going to break the arm of the wicked and he will call the wicked into account. They will be held accountable no matter what they think and no matter how they act this side of heaven. When we meditate on these things, we see the psalmist speaking the truth about God. He is repeating this over and over and over again, and that's adding weight to this arrowhead. What is true? And you know, this helps me when I'm upset. When I am upset and out of my mind, I need to remind myself of what is true about God because that out of my mind feeling derails me from being productive in any way. And I'm not talking about accomplishing big things like building a house. I'm talking about getting out of bed and smiling at people. <laughs> and when I'm despairing, that is very hard to do. And the only stabilizing thing that I have is what is true about God. When I'm in pain, when I am feeling victimized, I've got to do that. I have to remember that I belong to God and I have to remember what he's like. And I have to remind myself of what I can believe about him because that will encourage me to trust him. Okay, the last section then is, I'm gonna trust you, God. Therefore, I'm gonna trust you. Therefore, I. There's our therefore, I. There's our trust. There's the last step. And we see that as, as the psalm transitions in verses 14 through 15. Uh, let's see. Verse, verse 14 says, but. That's such a good word. Isn't it? Such mm -hmm. a good word. <laughs> the way I kind of think about it sometimes is I'm really upset about something. And I am a very emotional person. And so I feel things deeply and I get very emotional when I'm upset and it's sort of like my hair is on fire <laughs> and when when God stops me with the word but it's like he's holding me by the shoulders and saying stop but 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 all this is going on but God you do see mm -hmm. there's such a strong transition here 
for you note mischief and vexation that you may take it into your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. That is quite a transition. You know, for God to note mischief and vexation means that he sees it and he's keeping track. Again, it kind of reminds me of the clipboard. Remember that illustration that we had a few Psalms back? He knows. He knows. And he's keeping that and seeing that so that he can take it into his hands. He doesn't want us to hold it into our hands. It's in his hands. This is truth. No matter what the suffering is, we have to remind ourselves that God does he see. And he will take it into his hands. The psalmist is speaking the truth that God hasn't forgotten him. This is essential for us when we are suffering, dear friends, because we can speak ourselves into a terrible, terrible place if we don't stop ourselves. We need truth. This brings in the next verses this big expression of confidence in God, a confidence that one thing will be made, one day things will be made right. And it's kind of like that, but that holding on to the shoulders of David, but helps him transition and then helps him speak forth all these words of confidence. Listen to the promises in 16 through 18. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man is of the earth may strike terror no more. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's a lot of confidence in three verses. Those are strong words. You know, it says God is king forever and ever. That means he's king right now and he will be for all eternity. And the part that talks about the nations perishing from his land, that's talking about how he will cause the wicked to perish. They can't go to heaven. If they're not redeemed, they won't be there. You know, in the Old Testament, they were to be removed from the land of Canaan so that the Israelites could go in. Well, one day in the new heavens and the new earth, they will be no more. Now, of course, we want this to happen today, don't we? But our good God has a plan and a purpose, and he will do it. He says so. It also says in verse 17 that God hears the desires of the afflicted. He knows what you're wanting. He hears you, and he knows. What do we want? What did they want? We want pain to be over, and we want the wicked punished don't we? I get kind of feisty about that. You can ask the counselors about that. There's a little joke going around right now about my feistiness about wicked people, and I'm not going to repeat it here because I just don't think I should. But anyway, I've been very frustrated with wicked people, and it has to do with what I'd like to do with my car. But in any case, we're going to move ahead, and we're going to talk about when we suffer unjustly, we want the wicked caught. Now, sometimes in that context, we're actually participating in the suffering of Christ, aren't we? That's a whole talk, which we aren't going to go into. But we don't know all the reasons why God is allowing suffering, and especially suffering of the innocent. But he has something in it for us, even especially if we're innocent. He wants us to learn something. What might God be doing in our lives as we participate with him in this way? How can he be glorified as we walk through the sufferings of this life? How did Jesus respond when he was tortured? Ooh. Did he return evil for evil? Did he sin in his response to oppression? How can we become like him even in this? You know, another encouragement from these last verses says, that God strengthens their hearts and he inclines his ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man is of the earth may strike terror no more. That verse is so encouraging to me. One day the wicked will be no more. 
God will execute justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. We must ask him for that and remind ourselves of what he has done. As we do this, our rope gets stronger and we can encourage ourselves and others with his provision and his faithfulness. We've got to remember that this world was never meant to satisfy. The only things that we're going to bring to heaven with us are people and God's word. This world is not our home. God does not want us to cling to it tightly. As we walk through challenging seasons, we've got to trust that our good God is growing us into the image of his son, and he's causing us to glorify him more and more. And he knows how hard this is for us. He hears us and promises to make it right one day. And boy, I think that's part of his trying to get us to let go of some of the things that we think are really precious. Mm -hmm. That picture, whenever I talk about that, it kind of reminds me of a mama cat where she's carrying her baby around mm -hmm. and how she carries the baby kind of at the scruff of the neck. And sometimes she's kind of shaking the baby a little bit. It's sort of like God's doing that to us. <laughs> like stop depending on this place. This isn't your home. Mm -hmm. I think we can all say that we are more encouraged listening to someone who has overcome trial and come out with joy mm -hmm. than with someone who's as thin as a piece of paper. <laughs> you know, life is always just rainbow and unicorns. Everything's great. No, it's great. It's fun. It's great. But then you talk to someone who's walked through something really intense and they love the Lord. Isn't your heart encouraged by that? Very much. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways that God uses our suffering, even the unjust suffering of the wicked, mm -hmm. to glorify himself. Mm -hmm. It gives opportunity to speak about him to people that we might not have. Mm -hmm. We have got to remember that Satan is the prince of this world. Why would we expect anything in this world to make us happy or meet our needs or give us the rest and joy and peace that we're seeking? Mm -hmm. It can't. God wants us to let go of those things. He wants us to long for heaven where there will be no more tears or mourning or pain, where the old has passed away and the new has come. It's not wrong to cry out to God in pain when we're suffering. This, light, this life hurts a lot. Mm -hmm. We are image bearers and we feel deeply, yet we are crying out to a good God who listens and loves and is accomplishing something far beyond anything that we can imagine. As the wicked seem to prosper, we must remember that our God reigns. He is king forever. He is the helper to the fatherless, and he will punish all wickedness and give everlasting joy to his children. That is something we can look to and be encouraged about, heaven. So we call out to God and we lament in our suffering. Then we remind ourselves what is true about him and we choose to trust him. We must remember that the Lord misses nothing. He does not he does not and will not forget. He isn't like us. Sometimes, yes, he allows hard things, but he knows what he is doing and he knows what the end result will be and is supposed to be. We don't, but if we trust him, we will be safe. Our job isn't to be the punishers of the wicked. We're not to seek vengeance, but we're to trust the one who promises to deal with them justly. As we do this, we can have a more peaceful heart in times of suffering, and we can train our children to think rightly about life and its hardships and instill in them a hope of heaven. What a gift! that would be. Let's take some time today and this month to think about our sufferings in life in light of what we've learned about God in Psalm 10. God isn't far off and he is trustworthy. And Linda and I are praying for you that you will trust him today and always. We are so thankful for all of you and we look forward to hear how you have grown together through studying Psalm 10 this month. Mm, thank you, Kelly. Wow. Praise God. You've Praise given God. us so much to think about and 
God's word is amazing. Yes. I can't wait to actually listen to this again and take notes because there was so much there that was just good for my soul today. Good. Praise the Lord. Just remembering this. <laughs> I know. The most important thing is what goes on between our ears, thinking about what is true about God. Well, and we've talked about, we didn't talk about it earlier, but we've talked about the fact that this arrow can't fly straight if there's not good weight. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to shoot an arrow mm -hmm. this way. <laughs> and it doesn't in work. A, in a real bow, and it won't work. It just flips around like that, and it lands on the ground. It can't mm -hmm. fly straight if the feathers are first. Mm -hmm. So we're never going to lose if we focus on adding truth, mm -hmm. adding weight here. Yes. Yeah. I kept, I've been reading through the Old Testament lately, and the Israelites, they keep complaining in a sinful way. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I keep thinking about what's the difference between David saying, why, Lord, or how long? And the Israelites, that when a hard situation comes their way and they're like, what in the world's going on? We should have just, you, should, you just should have left us in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then God is angry with them because they're complaining. They stay in the complaint. Yeah. They just complain. They don't come back to, but God did just bring us through the Red Sea. Yeah. But God did show us himself faithful. Oh, that's really good. But actually, nothing is mine. Who am I? I'm unworthy. They don't say any of that. That's they true. They just complain. And I love how mm. we see an example, because sometimes you, you go, is it okay to complain? What? <laughs> but there's, look at the Old Testament, and you can see what it looks like to complain sinfully, because God's not happy with it. And then you see these beautiful examples of lament, mm. where we can be honest with God yeah. about what's already going on in our heads really anyhow, good. and bring it to Him in prayer, and then say the all-important words, but yet... Yeah. and trust his character. So thank you for that, That's Kelly. Really good. And you know, thank you for bringing that out. I, I want to study what you just said you were studying. It seems like in my recollection when the Israelites were complaining, there was a lot of complaining back and forth mm -hmm. this direction instead of this direction. Mm -hmm. I can't believe God did this to us. Why did he bring us here mm -hmm. instead of God? Yeah. word but i'd yeah. have to go back That's and a really study good it observation more. I, like were they really bringing it to god they brought right. it to poor moses who got right. exhausted <laughs> right <laughs> poor guy <laughs> yeah oh, so well, well it was so good to be with you again i'll yeah, miss you really I'll be good at our, i mentioned the same son and daughter-in-law both graduated that's right yes i don't want to miss that so no. super proud of them but yeah. have a wonderful time next month yeah. at your gathering we love you yeah bye